Today's video is going to be a little bit different. I'm going to be doing a tier list of my favourite basses, as that's apparently what people do nowadays. There are 20 different basses I'm going to rank today, and I'll be using a tier list. Tier lists are really useful in the gaming community to rank different characters, and you might find some other people ranking their favourite albums, or their favourite chocolate bars and stuff like that. Take a look at the tier list, the letter S will be at the top, and that stands for super or superb. In our case, it means top of the line, best of the best, unbeatable. Then you have A, B and C, and that degrades in performance the further down the graph you go. Speaking of the ratings, there are four axes I'll be rating these bases on. Aesthetics, how does it look? How does it feel? How does it play? Is it heavy? So on. Electronics, how does it sound? How does it compare to the others? Is it very limited? Does it have more options? And stuff like that. Price, which is pretty self-explanatory, but in this case it will be, is this bass worth the price point? And then lastly, we have versatility, which will be subjective according to my own opinion, and basically means, will this bass play in a variety of musical genres, or is it a one-trick pony? And then we have the final verdict, which will allow me to put it onto our tier board. One small disclaimer before we begin, this video is for entertainment, so if you own one of these bases and you don't agree with me, that's all fine. I've played a handful of these bases and watched a handful of reviews of the others. My opinion is subjective, and if we disagree, we can still be friends. I've made a playlist of all of the videos used in reference to this tier list, and you can find that in the description if you want to hear for yourself. Right, let's get to it. The Hofner Violin Bass. The Hofner 500-1, iconically speaking, is from a bygone age. Uh, and it's just not something I really like. You wouldn't really see a metal band on stage rocking it to Rain and Blood by Slayer. So it's not to my liking. The electronics are very smooth, very plucky, but very boxy. And boxy because of the hollow body, which, unless you're going for an acoustic sound, that boxiness will really get in the way of things and just make it a bit muddy. In terms of versatility, it's not a base for every genre. It has very limited application. It's definitely a bass that will let you sit very tight in the mix, pluck along to your heart's content, and not really do much else with it. And because of the price tag, if we take a look at the price, £1,700, $2,400, or €2,000. Just through the high price tag alone and the lack of versatility, I'm going to have to give it bottom of the barrel D verdict. The price of that bass is outrageous, especially for its lack of applications. No way. Next, we're on to Fender Precisions. A very quick story about precision basses. All my life, I have not liked precision basses. I thought they were too clunky or boxy and whatever. Last year, I went to a bass shop and I incidentally tried a Made in Mexico precision bass. It changed my life. I wanted to buy the thing then and there. It was beautiful. It felt good, it played good, the sound was amazing, and it was just in a league of its own compared to your knockoff at entry level fenders, or entry level precision bases for that matter. So don't knock precision bases, especially something like Fender. And this was a made in Mexico one, so that's not even top of the range. Onto the tier list. If we look at the Fender Precision, there are so many models, it's very difficult to choose which one. So I'm just looking at Fender American Professional, which is £1,500. The top of the line versions are $2,100 or €1,700. Euros. When you think of a bass guitar, the only one that should really come to mind is a Fender Precision, and Leo Fender made it right first time. Of course, he proves me wrong by doing further alterations and modifications and new releases and everything else with the Stingrays and everything else, but the Fender Precision is a good place to start. The electronics are fair, they're good, and it has its own unique sound, but it has a very limited application. It's kind of bottom-endy and boomy, right? It's not useful for every application. So the versatility could do better. In terms of price, the top of the line model, the Fender American Professional, it's a bit too much for what it is. And I think you get diminishing returns. There's not a great deal of change between a made in Mexico and a made in America precision. So in terms of verdict, I'm gonna give it a B, but I think we can do better. Just for comparison, right? This is bottom of the barrel from Squire. The Squire Affinity Bronco, 179 pounds, $250 or 200 euros. The thing looks like a toy, and I suppose for the money it is a toy. It's a beginner's tool. When your kid says they want to play bass, you give them a toy to make sure they're not going to waste further money on this hobby. 
It's a bit overpriced for the package. I think you're buying the name Squire and Fender more than anything else. And versatility, it passes as a bass with just one pickup, barely, right? I mean, you can, you can get some sound out of it, but let's just say it's lacking to say the least. Versatility, I can see some applications with it, but I know it will leave you wanting more. Verdict, straight to the bottom of the pile, D. The Made in Mexico Fender Jazz. Probably the most ergonomic bass you'll find on the market. The body curves just fit your torso properly, the neck is nice and thin, the neck is agile to play and gives you really easy access. It is a really comfortable bass. The electronics are bare basics but acceptable, and if you're looking for that jazz bass sound, and for the price of £500, $400 or €600, Euros, I'd be quite happy with the price of this. You can play almost any genre of music comfortably, but you're going to be missing out on a little bit more tonal range, detail and things like that. I'm going to give it a B. On the flip side of the coin, we have the top of the line Fender American Ultra Jazz. Again, probably the most ergonomic body shape you'll find. The neck is super thin and comfortable. The price is too high for me. £2,000, $2,800 or €2,300. But I can appreciate it's a Fender Jazz made in America with all of the bells and whistles at no expense spared. The electronics are full with thick pickups and it has a very specific range that is iconic. You can't miss a proper Fender Jazz and it will suit 85% of applications. Me personally, I'd like a little bit more bottom end on there just to give it a bit of a boost. I'm going to give it an A rating um, for practicality. However, the price range, £2,000 for a bass guitar, is way too much. A Fender Aerodyne. Now, I own one of these basses, so I know of what I speak. Aesthetically speaking, this is my favourite bass. This bass is beautiful. It is like a stealth jet fighter. It is amazing, and I love it. It takes the ergonomics of the Fender Jazz, makes it even thinner, and gives you cream binding with no fret inlays. However, <laughs> in terms of its price, it's overpriced for what you get. And I feel like you're getting the Fender name, but in a different style. It costs £800, $1,100, or €900. Euros. Now, my problem is the electronics are very quiet. I know it's a passive bass, but this is quiet. And the dynamic range in the bass is very weak. The body is made of bass wood, and the neck is rosewood. And both of those elements give it a nice, light, snappy tongue, which sits really well in a mix and really cuts through when you can hear it. So, like I say, I own this bass, I really love it. I want to put the bass in B, but the output on the bass is just not enough for me. I just want a little bit more oomph in there, a little bit more of a grunt and a shunt. So for that reason, it's going to be a C. The Gibson Thunderbird is another one of those iconic basses. It's pure cigarette hanging out of the mouth, rock and roll fun. Unfortunately, practically speaking, it suffers from a lot of neck dive and it's not really ergonomic to play and hold on to. In terms of the electronics, the tone is brilliant and iconic for sure. It's deep and gritty, perhaps on the muddy side, and not much clarity to speak of. In terms of versatility, it's very limited in the genres. You'll be sat very tight in the mix holding down the bottom end, but I wouldn't expect much more from it. The price is far too high with its practical applications concerned and ergonomic problems. It's nearly £1,800, $2,500 and €2,000. That price is outrageous for the limitations of this bass. And I really think you're buying an image to go with this bass rather than the instrument. So when you putter up with the price, it's far too high with its practical applications considered. The verdict is a C. In a similar boat is the Gibson SG Standard Bass. Another iconic bass, but let's be honest, it looks way better as a guitar in Tony Iommi's hands than it does a bass. In terms of electronics, it really does fall into the same camp as the Thunderbird, a very thick tone that's slightly muddy and very tight in the mix. In terms of its practical applications, it's more about holding down the bottom end than doing anything fancy. The price of this bass goes up to £1,200, $1,700 or €1,400. Euros. I'm going to give it a C, but only because I prefer the guitar version. If you really like this bass, the Epiphone version is way cheaper, £320, $450 or €370. Euros. That's a big difference. 
and I guess you get what you pay for. The Gibson Ripper, another Gibson on the list. It's almost a whole tree branch, and I'm amazed at how big some of these bases can get. In terms of its electronic, it's a beast with two unique humbuckers, it's loud and growls, but not in an obnoxious way. There's so much potential for it to just sit in the mix or come out and grab you. There's so much potential for this bass to be used in every situation and I love it for that. It's such a great sounding bass. And even for the price tag, if you can find them second hand, it's usually between one to two thousand pounds, fourteen hundred to twenty eight hundred dollars, eleven hundred to twenty three hundred euros. If you can get it on the low end, I think it would be worth it. It is a great sounding bass and I think you'll go a long way with it. It will play in every situation. So for verdict, I'm going to go with B. But I'm sure if I played it every night on stage, the weight, because the thing is really heavy, the weight would make it a C. But we'll stick with B. It's a good bass. Ibanez. Okay, the GSR205. In terms of aesthetics, I'm not a big fan of these GSR SR Ibanez models. They're a bit toy-like in my opinion. There's just something about them that seems second class. In terms of electronics, let's just say they're affordable. They get the job done, but they don't really have much range. I really feel like this bass would sit well in a modern metal band, if that's your thing. It has a bit of a high-end twang to help you cut through the mix, and a little bit of a honk in the lower mids. But the strength of this bass is also its weakness. It lacks a lot of tonal range, not enough bottom end, not enough EQing, and unfortunately it's a bit of a one-trick pony. Looking at the price of these things, the lowest models, which I think is the GSR 205, it's £250, £350, €290. Euros. On the flip side, the top of the line Ibanez model with all of the bells and whistles, the SR1825, that'll cost you £1,000, £1,400 or €1,100. Euros. And I still don't think I'm impressed even with the top model. It still has a limitation around it that I don't like. And just for that reason, I'm going to have to give it a D. I just find these bases lacking in every regard. The ATK305. Now I own this base, so I'm quite familiar with it. The curves are really nice to look at, and as usual, Ibanez have done their own thing, which is commendable. It's completely unique. There's something not quite right with the fretboard. I find the wood on there is very dull. Now I know it's subjective whether or not the fretboard actually affects the tone of the instrument, but for me there's something about this fretboard that I don't like. It feels like it's not performing well enough. In terms of electronics, it has a single Music Man style pickup in the bridge, and when this bass came out, it was said to be a Music Man killer. I don't think it is. It's a, it's a good sounding bass, but it's not a Music Man killer. They're in the same ballpark. And when I say ballpark, I don't mean they're similar. It's the same ballpark. <laughs> it won't be taking rain over the Stingray anytime soon. It's a good tone, it's a thick tone, it's, it's pleasant. Not much honk like you would get in a Music Man. It's different, and it's, it's almost like a different take of the Music Man. Let's take a look at the price, and this is comparing the five string version, which I own. 700 pounds, $1,000 or 800 euros. I think the price is reasonable. It's just getting up to that mid tier when you're getting out of beginner gear. And I think the build quality to this level is sufficient and the pickup is very good. So yeah, I think the price is quite reasonable. In terms of versatility, I think you can get away with playing any musical genre quite comfortably. But for me, I want a little bit more range from the thing and I'll be very happy. So for that reason, it's a C verdict. The Yamaha BB2024. Now, in terms of aesthetics, Yamaha are doing their own thing. It's a non-offensive looking bass, which is quite nice to look at. It's built like a tank. It's a workman's tool for sure. In terms of its electronics, thanks to its beefy build, you get great sustain. It's like a precision bass on steroids and it shows. It's a classic sound. You might even mistake it for a precision bass. In terms of versatility, I think you can get away with most musical styles especially if you're going for a Fender type classic sound. This is an alternative to the Fender basses and it does its job very well. So Taking a look at the price tag though, £1,900, $2,700 or €2,200. It's a lot of money, but I really think this is a workman's tool and if you are a professional musician and this is what you want, a, a Fender on a steroids, I think that price is acceptable. Maybe not 19 15 maybe. It's going to be a B verdict. 
the Lakeland 5501. Now, I own the Lakeland 4401. In the picture is the five string model. So my experiences are of the four string, this is just the five string model. And you should know I am extremely biased about this bass. I love it. The shape of the bass has its own personality and it's a very comfortable instrument, minus the weight issues. The electronics, the pickups on this bass are amazing. I absolutely love the Bartolini pickups and the preamp on this thing. The neck pickup gives you a really nice precision sound and the bridge a bit of a jazz-esque sound. And it's just in a world of its own. I love this thing, it sounds amazing. I have done a review on this bass if you wanna see it and links to that are up above. In terms of price, we're looking at the Skyline series here, which is the budget option of Lakeland. They are crafted in Korea. For the price of £700, $1,000 or €800, Euros, I think that is spot on. The build quality of this bass is impeccable. And for that money, it is a bargain. It really is. Highly recommended. My verdict is A, as you can guess. I would give it an S if it was a little bit lighter and I, there were a few changes to its output to suit my preference. But we go with A, nothing's perfect, right? The Music Man Stingray, another iconic bass. It's beautiful and simple, created by Leo Fender, and as I alluded to earlier, another modification of a precision bass made by Leo. In terms of electronics, as a fat low end, quite a tight tone for walking bass lines that's very articulate and has a lot of definition. And it's great for holding down the low end. In terms of its versatility, I really feel like it sounds like a Thunderbird with the growl and the same character, but it has a bit more functionality because of EQs. And then when you look at the double humbucker versions, it just opens up a world of opportunity. The price is a bit of an issue. The price is £2,100, $3,000 or €2,400. That's a lot of money. Um, I can only imagine it's the full bells and whistles version and it's a workman's tool. Um, for that reason, I'm going to have to give it a B. I might knock a few points off for the price though. <laughs> but speaking of price, let's look at the flip side. The, the Stingray by Sterling. Not much more really to talk about. It looks the same as the Music Man, bar a couple of differences. I think the Sterling version is lighter. For price, it's £700, $1,000 or €800. Euros. If you want the tone of the Stingray, it's definitely worth trying out. For the electronics, it has a two-band EQ, which is better than nothing, but it doesn't have that full body range like a normal Stingray. It still has the same growl as a Stingray, but it really sounds a bit thin in the mid-range registers. Yeah, it's practical, and for the price, you can't really complain. There is still a way to go before it's on par with the classic, so I'll give it a C verdict. Next up is the Rickenbacker 4003, another iconic bass, and I love it. It's just a beautiful piece of art, for sure. In terms of electronics, I would put this in the same camp as a Gibson Thunderbird. A thick bottom end that sits in a mix. And I would complain about that and say I want a bit more range out of these pickups. However, I really like this tone. I just prefer it to a Thunderbird. The output could be a little bit hotter in my opinion, but for some reason it just works. It works better than a Thunderbird. Now, take a look at the price tag. It's £1,800, $2,500 or €2,100. Euros. That price is just way too high. But when you look at it, you're buying a piece of bass history and it's proficient at what it does best. It really is good at that. I would just love it if the price could come down a little bit to make it a bit more affordable. In terms of versatility, I really think it's a B and I like it more than the Thunderbird. It doesn't have the neck dive and the tone is much more musically pleasing to my ears. Warwick Streamer Stage 1. Aesthetically speaking, it's an interesting body shape. Not exactly my preference, but at least it has character. The bass has extreme articulation and definition. It's a wonderfully tight bass, but with a price point of £1,500, $2,100 or €1,700, I would imagine the price reflects the build quality. This is a professional musician's bass. I would have to seriously consider the price tag of this thing before buying one. In terms of versatility, I think you could easily get away with all musical genres. It has a great tone, a great range, and professionally crafted. My verdict is an A. The Wall Mark II Custom. In terms of aesthetics, it looks like a Lakeland, which I kind of like. So it has that going for it. Wall pickups are highly sought after. Take a look at my Getty Lee video and you'll see all about why they're so special. Their pickups have a unique sound and are explosive. It's a really weird crossover of a Thunderbird and Rickenbacker sound 
with some of the articulation and honk of a jazz bass. It's just completely out there. You can definitely hear a jazz honk in that sound. It's beautiful, I love it. Now for the price tag, we're looking at £4,000, $5,600 or €4,600. Euros. The price is unbelievable, but the instruments are of a superior quality. In terms of versatility, I can't fault it. It holds the low end, it has really nice articulation and punchiness, and it does slap. It is just unbeatable. And for that reason, I'm gonna put it as an A. But you know what, I already said it, it's superior. It's an S. It's gonna to have to be an S. It's difficult to put it in an A as it offers so much more than any other bass. But the price is a hurting point. Yeah, it's an S. I'll put it as an S. The Spectre Euro 4 LT. Aesthetically speaking, it's a bit like a slim Warwick, isn't it? It's nice and compact. The finishes are just works of art. They are really something. In terms of electronics, it really reminds me of a Warwick streamer. But this one has Bartolini pickups and a dark glass tongue capsule. Lots of attack, lots of articulation, and lots of tongue. You really think I'd like it? I don't. <laughs> I find in some of the demos I've watched, it's a little bit thin in some areas, um, but it does have quite a lot of potential for you to dial in the sound you do want. So I'm sure there's lots of potential there that I haven't seen, but I'd love to try one. In terms of versatility, there's no doubt it will play in any genre. It covers the low end, it covers the mids, and you have enough of the top end for slapping and tapping. It's a beautiful bass. I would have to seriously consider the price tag before buying it at £2,000, $2,800, or €2,300. Euros. I don't know why that picture's rotated. That's really annoyed me. An unexpected bass on the list is the PVT-40. Another thick tree branch here, a solid tone and a beast of a bass. It is a beast and it screams the 1970s to me. But I find the aesthetic quite endearing. It's really classic looking, I love it. You might be able to find some of these second hand and the prices are reasonable. They're 700 pounds, $1,000 or 800 euros. If you can find one, I really think the price is spot on. It's a huge piece of wood with a lovely sustain and thundering pickups. I would gladly pay that price. So if you're selling one, let me know. <laughs> the electronics are amazing. They are just unlike anything else I've heard in this era of basses. It's a really deep, thick tone and you can really delve in and twiddle around with the smooth bottom end or a really nice articulate sound. I think it has it all. I think it's a really good bass. In terms of versatility, I have no doubt it can do all genres. It's really good bass and the sounds you can get out of this thing are incredible. It is amazing. And I really wish there were more basses that sounded like the T40. In terms of verdict, I'm going to give it an S. I love the tone way too much to worry about the weight of this thing. I really wish, I really wish I could buy one and I really wish more basses could sound like this and that we had more examples of this tone in music. It is superb and it's an S. The Dingwall Combustion, a little bit of a new company in, in modern times. I think they came around in 2004. The recent trends in basses are these fanned or multi-fret basses and they are quite practical and I'd really love to get my hands on one and see what I can put it through. Because when you listen to the low B on this thing, they sing. They, are just, they just have the right clarity that you are expecting when you want to hear a B string. Most of them are just floppy and don't really have that punch or articulation naturally. But I really do find that combustion has that. And for that reason, it's something I'd like to play and consider using. For the electronics, they have their own in-house pickups, which are very bright and modern sounding and will help you cut through the mix. In terms of versatility, I really think you have the options to play most musical genres. I think there's a lot in there in terms of EQ and pickup arrangements to really get what you want. I don't want to say the bass is over-engineered, but I really feel like if you knew where this bass would fit into your rig and your sound, I can see the price being justified. But for a casual player like me, it's asking a little bit too much. And the price comes in at £1,500, $1,200 or €1,700. Euros. So I'm going to give it an A. I think it's a well-rounded, punchy, very well-designed bass and something new we haven't seen before. You know, especially when we look at the precision basses and now we're looking at the dingwalls, 
this is an this is a step in the right direction. So yeah, I'll give it a name. All right, so let's take a look at our final list. And we have the Wall Mark II. And like I said, I just feel like these two bases can cover every turn out of every genre and do it really well. Price might be an issue, but say you're a professional musician and you're going gig to gig, genre to genre, that's a worthy investment to get a bass that will do all of that. The A tier, you can't go wrong with any of them. They will play most genres properly and, and functionally not leave you wanting much more. You have most of the functions of a normal professional bass. The B tier, they're good. They're good at what they do, but they lack something. Again, that's subjective, that's what I think. I just feel like the bases in this list, in the B tier, they're lacking something that, that would push them over to another level. In the C tier, all of these bases have something iconic or unique about them, which gives them a nice, unique selling point. Functionally speaking, they're not up to scratch. They won't play in all musical situations. They'd be very good at one thing, which if that is your bag, Brilliant, more power to you, that's great. Um, but if you want something a bit more versatile, you're gonna want the higher tiers. And then in the D tier, <laughs> the D tier. If you own any of these bases in the D tier, um, I'm not sorry. <laughs> I'll be honest, the, the, the violin bass is just not something I enjoy. I don't like it, I don't like the sound, I don't like the look of it. There's a reason people like it, but not me. The Bronco bass, uh, it only just passes as a bass. It might as well be a broom handle with a bass string on it because it's it's not a real bass. If you have one and you like playing bass, do yourself a favour and buy something a little bit better. And you might wonder why did I put these Ivan SSR basses down here? I just find them too thin. I don't like them. It's like taking everything bad about the Aerodyne bass and putting it with a preamp. Um, I just don't like them. I don't like the sound. They, I guess you would say they're too modern. I don't like them in that sense. I like a nice, thick, warm bass tone. Um, that's not an Ivan S like that. But I'm sure some of you guys have them and that's fine. If you think you have the most amazing bass tone from an SR model or a GSR model, show me, prove to me I'm wrong. I won't mind. There is a link to this very same tier list in the description by all means go ahead and make your own, send them to me, and tell me how we differ. And I hope we can still be friends. As I mentioned earlier in the video, I own two of the bases mentioned today, the Fender Aerodyne and the Ibanez ATK305, and I will be reviewing these bases very soon. So if you're new here and you want to see that, make sure you click the subscribe button and you will be notified when those videos come out. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next time.